church pastor. Mm, whew, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. 43 years. Mm. My, my, my. She be a blessing. Well, you know, I, I'm real excited tonight. You know, uh, I, I believe in Holy Ghost appointments. I believe that God can divinely bring things into your life. And, you know, I met Brother Jimmy Stanfield back 25, 27 years ago. <laughs> I mean, he was a pup then. And I was just going at it in ministry over at Abundant Life, and, and I ran into him. And we just had that Holy Ghost kindred spirit that just you knew that that person and you were on the same page in God. You ever been on the same page with somebody in God? It's like honey flows from the rock. It's like, man, it's just, it's just like iron sharpens iron. It's just, it's just, ooh, I want some more, some more, some more. Well, you know, I, I lost contact with him for many, many years. And then uh, I saw his brother. His brother sells shrimp. And uh, when we was going fishing, me and Joe, and, and we stopped and got some live shrimp. And when we were leaving, uh, here this brother pulled up. And I saw him say, hey, how's Jimmy doing? And he said, oh, I think he's over in Nicaragua. He's been over there, you know, for a couple of years and been doing stuff. And I, I said, well, look, here's my business. Give it to him and let, let him know I, I want to get in touch with him. Well, this morning I was in bed. My wife comes on the phone and says, hey, somebody, I don't know the number. Somebody's wanting you. It was Jimmy. I said, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Praise God. He said, my brother said he saw you. And we got to hooking up. And, man, I'll let you him tell the rest of it. But, you know, it was just God. And I said, hey, just come preach for him tonight. Amen. You know, I just, I just like those unctions to function. And so I'm just going to just right now just turn it over to my brother and just give a warm welcome and clap your hands for Brother Jimmy Stanthrill. Praise God, Jimmy. Woo! We want to welcome our Internet audience first. I've never preached to a camera before, at least not that I knew of. But um, praise God. We're, we're glad you joined in. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I knew Mr. Benson years ago at Abundant Life. I brought him an idea for a new converts class. And he said, that looks good. Expand it. Could you make the outline a little bigger? So I said, yeah, I guess. So I went home and I made it bigger. I expanded it. And I came back. I thought I was finished. He said, make it bigger than that. I like this. Okay, fine. So I brought it back again. And he said, well, can you make it bigger? I thought, well, if I make it any bigger, I might as well write a book. And that's when it hit me. I got a book up here. So I did. And he began to teach it at the Bible college over there. And, and well, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever, you know. Book publishing companies don't publish good books. They publish books that'll sell. Right. So it never got published. So, look, turn with me tonight. I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about the Lord. Turn with me tonight to the book of Luke, chapter 2, and we'll begin at the 21st verse. I, I preached this message Sunday morning in um, Hinotepe, uh, Nicaragua. And the guy I'm, I work with overseas doing missions, is he's 74 years old. He's a spirit-led man. And I sometimes don't know that I'm going to preach. And that morning he introduced himself and, and talked to the church. He said, you know, everybody should have a Timothy, somebody that you sow into. But everybody should have a Paul, somebody that sows into them. He says, I got a Timothy with me, but sometimes he's my Paul. This morning he's going to be my Paul. So that's all the introduction I got. So I got up and preached, and the Lord blessed it. And the message has really been on my heart. And um, talking to Mr. Benson this morning was providential. I know it was the Lord's divine appointment. And, and I think you're going to be blessed. I hope you're going to be blessed. I know you're going to be blessed because it's the Word of God. Yeah. 21, and when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, who was so named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of purification, according to the law of Moses, was accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death till he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit. That's important. He came by the Spirit. You know, the Bible says that many are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God. He came by the Spirit into the temple, and, it, and the parents... And, with, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let, let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of, my peop of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mothers marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce thine, through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
And there was one Anna, a prophetess. She was a prophetess. She, was, she, was, she received messages from God. She was led by the Spirit also. Of the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, 84, and departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers day and night. And she coming in in that instant, divine appointment, in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke to him, spoke of him unto all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And I want to minister for a few moments tonight using as a subject, I show you a better way. I want to show you a better way. Would you bow your heads? Father, we ask a blessing upon this teaching of your word. Lord, just flow, Lord. I don't want to be a preacher. I want, to, I want you to flow, Lord. I want you to be glorified. We'll ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want you to picture what it must have looked like the, the Temple Mount area, Mr. Benson may have been, I've never been to Jerusalem, but the Temple Mount area is huge. It'll hold almost a million people. <clears throat> it's like the Astrodome parking lot. It's humongous. People are going and coming all the time. And when they excavated Jerusalem, they found little pools, like baptismal pools, you know, about this high, this deep, and steps going down into them as people were coming up into Jerusalem. Part of the book of Psalms was written for people coming from the countryside up into Jerusalem to the temple, the center of the Jewish religion. And they would sing the Psalms. They were originally sung. And they would go down into these pools, and symbolically they were cleansing themselves. You know, we ought to confess ourselves sometimes before we come to church. I got in the habit of doing that when I got to reading the Bible deeply. I, I got in the habit of, if I have any sin in my heart, I, want to, I don't want to come before the Lord in the presence of God with anything that, that shouldn't be there, right? And th this was the idea behind these little pools. And so people would come, and they would walk through these pools. Symbolically, it meant cleansing, and, and their hearts were right. They were singing and praising and going up to the temple. <clears throat> thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. This was normal, a normal day in ancient Israel. Maybe, maybe one of the guys from the country, maybe there was a man who's... who's had bought some land, and he was seeking God's blessing on that land. So he was coming up to Jerusalem, and he was going to make a sacrifice and, and pray and, and just come before the God of Israel, the God of his fathers, and ask a blessing upon his land, upon his family. Or, or maybe there was another guy. His daughter was getting married, and he wanted a, a, the wedding to be blessed. He wanted his son-in-law to be a good man, and he didn't know. So he was bringing a sacrifice, and he was going to come up before the God of Israel. Or maybe there was another one that had, had other issues. You know, maybe he had sin in his life. Maybe he had fallen away from God and had sin, and the guilt of his conscience bothered him, and he ran into somebody that ministered the word a little bit and, and told him he needs to get this right. So he bought a, a lamb, or if he was poor, he bought turtle doves like, like Joseph and Mary, and he brought them up, and he was, he was going up to the temple, and he had business to attend to with the God of Israel. And, and then there were, would have been others, just like Mary and Joseph, who were bringing their baby to be dedicated, to, basically, to, to be you know, dedicated to the Lord to offer a sacrifice as prescribed in the law of Moses. And so, you know, maybe there would be a, a, a Levite on his way to work. Picture it, what it looked like. A young couple holding a baby, a newborn. You know, we all, everybody loves babies, right? I mean, he, the Levite might have looked and said, oh, no, what a cute baby, and smiled and gone on. Or, or the, the man bringing the sacrifice for his for his family or for his business, may have seen the baby and looked, and, but they didn't have time to, to, you know, ogle over the baby. Oh, how cute. They didn't have time for that. They were going up to do business with the God of Israel. They had business to attend to with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had business with the God of Israel. And they didn't realize that when they walked past that couple carrying that baby in their arms, they just walked past the God of Israel. That baby was the one who said, let there be light. And it was so. That baby was the one who told Noah, build a boat because it's coming to rain. That baby was the one who called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, get you to a land that I'll show you. That was the one. That baby was the one who spoke to Moses out of that burning bush and said, take off your shoes from off your feet. You're standing on holy ground. That was the one. They had business to attend with the God of Israel.
my fault. <laughs> I, I'm, I like being wound up. The, their whole religion was focused on the Messiah. Testing, testing, testing. Okay. <laughs> the, um, how, how could the, the majority of God's people miss the Messiah that they spent their whole lives looking for? Think about it. See, I think the first coming of, of Christ and the second coming of Christ have this in common. God's people are looking in the wrong direction. They're, they're, they're not making the main thing the main thing. We sang about it. Jesus is all I need. I know most people who sing that song think they need a lot more than Jesus. The, the church today can be roughly, the Bible-believing church, I mean, can roughly be divided into, like, the Baptists and the Charismatics, right? Generally, I'm generalizing now. I went to a Southern Baptist seminary, and I used to joke with them, you know, Baptists are the only people I know who every four years look longingly hopefully and prayerfully for the second coming of Reagan. Je <laughs> Jesus, not so much. Isn't that what the Jews were doing? Looking for a political messiah? The Roman Empire had, had taken and invaded their country, and they were living under a foreign occupation. They had a right to be upset with that and discontent with that. They were looking, they were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for the descendant of King David riding a horse and bringing warriors in. They were looking for the power of God to deliver them from the Roman Empire. They were looking for a political Messiah as much of the church today is looking for a political Messiah. I, I, much of the church today, I, I, on, on Wednesdays I pray at a prayer meeting with a lot of uh, Baptist ministers, not all, but most of them are pastors, and, and oftentimes when they pray, I'm hearing the influence of Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh rather than Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's true. Then you got the other side, though. you got the Charismatics. you got the Pentecostal, us. They've been taught now for 20 years that God's will is God's greatest, highest ideal is for you to drive a Cadillac. They've been taught that it's God's will for, for the main thing is for you to, you know, wear nice clothes and have a lot of money and have a big bank account. I've got news for you. There's more important things than that. There's more important. God has a different sense of priority sometimes than we do. But, but both of those represent, and that's the majority of the church today perhaps, and both of those represent a looking for Jesus who can do something for you rather than looking for Jesus for who he is and what he yeah. is. And that is parallel to what we see in Luke chapter 2. Anna and Simeon. Simeon came up, the Bible says, by the Spirit. If you are led by the Holy Ghost, you're not interested as much in what Jesus can do for you as for who and what he is. Yeah. Oh, this is so important because few people are doing that today. Few people, a lot of people are filled with churches, uh, churches filled with people. But those people are there, and sometimes they're being encouraged to be there for the wrong reasons. I want to tell you something. If he didn't do no more for you than what he did 2,000 years ago at the cross, he's still worthy of all our praise. He's still worthy to be worshipped. He's still worthy to give your all. He's still worthy to own you, your property. You bought with the price, the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, Hallelujah. Don't make Jesus a means to an end. This is so sad, but I see this all the time. Jesus is not a means to an end. Hell, in other words, he's not, Jesus is not the means by which I'm going to have a successful life. Jesus is not a means to an end. He's an end in and of himself. God told Abraham, I am thy exceedingly great reward. Not the fact that I'm going to bless you and you're going to have all these descendants and, and the Messiah is going to come from you. Of all families of the earth, you're going to be the one. But that's not the big deal. The big deal is you know me. See, that's the thing to get excited about. We've, we've got to make the main thing the main thing. We've missed it. Somehow in the church, especially in the last 20, 30 years, we've missed it. We've completely missed it. We've been seeking him for what he can do for us. And we've been taught that. We've been taught that. I quit watching TV preachers after a while. It was just so, it had gotten to the point. Now, I hear it's changing, and I'm glad to hear that. 
But for a while there, it was just all about what you can manipulate God into giving you. God had been reduced to a series of principles that could be learned and manipulated. And if you confessed right, you were going to get things. You know, if you said the right things and if you gave your money to the right guy with the right anointing, you're going to quit fooling around with that stuff. Amen. Quit fooling around with that. You can't manipulate God. Amen. You can't. He doesn't want you. He's sovereign. Right. He's sovereign. You, he wants you to love him for who he is and for what he did at the cross. How can anybody in their right mind take communion thinking they're just going to manipulate God into giving them things? My Lord, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We wonder why revival doesn't come. Because repentance doesn't come for that. The whole church should be on their knees repenting yes. for that foolishness. We've, we've sought God the way people seek witches, the way people go to fortune tellers. We've returned God into a magic genie. If we rub the lamp just right, confess the right magic words, send the money to the right magic preacher, oh, then we'll get a happy, blessed life. Suddenly, you're going to have a supermodel wife <laughs> and, and a brand new pickup truck or whatever, you know. <laughs> And some people get that. And Jesus said, verily, they have their reward. We don't want that reward. Oh, there's a better way. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, no, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth. Man, that'd get you kicked off TBN. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> lay not up treasures for yourself on the earth, but lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Yes. Where neither moth nor rust corrupts, stock market crash doesn't affect it. You don't have to worry about the government taking it. No thieves up there to worry about. My Lord. You ought to be running the aisles thinking about that, the treasure you're laying up for when you're seeking Jesus for who and what he is, but for what, not for what he can do for you, but for who and what he is. It is. And I found this out over the years. The happiest a human being can be is when you know him. Yes. It's not when he does nice things for you. Money is a, is a false god. Success, you know how much, you know how much Bill Gates' money is going to be worth to him about five seconds after death? Zero. Zero. You know how much all that fame and adoration the Kardashians are going to, you know how much that's going to be worth to them five seconds after death? They're going to know. Oh my God, we were wrong. I invested in the wrong thing. I gave everything and now I've lost everything. But when you come to Jesus and say, no, Lord, you're the treasure. I don't want none of it. You're the treasure. The Augustine of Hippo Regis, the Catholics call him St. Augustine. He was, you know, if you'll read his writings, he's one of the early church fathers. He was probably, and he was certainly born again. But, but he, he writes in confessions that he was praying and the Lord spoke to him and said, what do you want, Augustine? You've prayed, you're faithful. What do you want? And he thought for a minute. He said, I want you, Lord. I want you. And the voice said, is that it? Is that all? Anything else? And he said, no, absolutely nothing. Just you. Just you. He understood where his treasure was. And if we understood where our treasure is, if we understood what and who our treasure, to know him, oh, to know him fills the longing soul. To know him, to know him, it is the, it's the supreme contentment. I know there's happy people in this world. I know there's happy marriages and, and there's people that live clean and live right and they're, and they're good Christian people. But, but the happiest you're going to be is if you know him. He's the treasure. Yeah. He's the goal. He's the point of existence. Right. He's our all. Yes, he's all we need. Don't just sing about it. Think about it. He is all we need. Yes. And if you have him, you're rich. Yeah. Though you be in prison. Yeah. If you have him, you're rich. Though you be in the hospital dying. If you have him, you're rich, though your friends have all left you. You know how many people have been martyred for the gospel's sake and said, oh, I count it but dung, Paul said, that I may win Christ. I count it but rubbish, trash, that I may win Christ. Nothing this world has to offer is worth knowing him. And the amazing thing is we can know him. Oh, what an amazing condescension on his part. Sinners, dirty, filthy, unclean, you know what's in your heart. I know what's in my heart. We deserve hell. Oh, but Jesus cleanses us. Think about, think about, think about the great irony of this. Mary and Joseph walking up to the temple. And in the middle of that temple was the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. And in the middle of that, that temple, the Holy of Holies was where the great sacrifice took place, the Day of Atonement. And they would take that lamb that represented Christ and they would sprinkle the blood seven times on that altar. Seven times. Seven is the number of completeness. The Bible says the old man falls seven times. The Lord will raise him up every time. Amen. Seven, they would sprinkle that blood. And that day, perhaps, well, that wasn't the David Thomas, but they had the outside altar. They were sprinkling blood upon it. And all of those lambs that they killed represented 
the one who would come, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And that baby in their arms, they didn't realize the supreme irony of that. They're going up to that temple, and that baby in her arms is the Lamb of God who will someday be slaughtered to die for the sins of the world. The day Jesus went up to Jerusalem to die that final time was the same day, historians tell us, that the the lambs were driven in for the Passover celebration. Thousands and thousands. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that I think it was 365 or something like that, thousand lambs. All day from morning to night, they would drive these lambs up to Jerusalem and they would be in the markets and people would buy them and families, one for per family, and they would buy these lambs and they would take them home and slaughter the lamb and they would eat them and they put the blood upon their door. Remember the old song? Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. All who believe him need never fear, for he will pass, he will pass over you. And when I see the blood, I said when I see the blood, yes, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Hallelujah. The death angel swept through the land. Judgment fell, but they were covered in the blood. They lived. Everybody else died, but they lived. They were blessed, and everybody else was cursed. When he sees the blood, he'll pass over you. All that sin, gone, washed away, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there's Mary and Joseph bringing that baby up there. To, To someday he would come back to Jerusalem, and they would nail him to that cross. For every bad thing you ever did. The Old Testament Jew would take a lamb and he would, he would lay his hands. Originally the man brought the sacrifice and he, he killed it himself. He would lay his hand on the, on the head of that animal. Symbolically his sins were transferred to that animal and they would kill that animal. The animal des- died the, the death. The man was saying, I deserve this, but he's going to take my place. That's the whole principle. Jesus died on that cross. And when you lay your hand on his head, symbolically, when you lay hold of him by faith, When you lay hold of him, all of your sins, past, present, and future, transferred to the cross. God sees the blood, and death passes right over you. Name written in the Lamb's book of life. Eternal life. And this is the promise. Everlasting life. My Lord, if we could grasp that, if we could get a hold of that, what what wouldn't we do? The church today needs to wake up. We have prioritized the wrong things. We have well-intentioned people have, have... have prioritized church work. Pastor Benson and I were talking this morning about how we have a tendency to turn everything into a work that we do. Legalism. Naturally, we want to do something for God. Here's something. They came to God, they came to Jesus in John chapter 6 and says, what what must we do that we might work the works of God? You want to hear what God wants you to do? I'm going to tell you right now what God wants. What must we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe. That's it. And yet, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, by grace you say by faith, and that faith not even of yourselves. It is a, so the work God calls you to do is something he gives you. Right. He calls you to do something he enables you to do. Amen. Right. Oh, there's no work involved. It's simply believe it. Amen? Amen? Oh, that's good news. That's good news. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. We've got so much to be grateful for. And when we get that revelation, and I, I have taught this stuff for years and I taught a theology class last year to some ministry students. And, and it's the same thing. We go into it. And I have taught it a million, it seems like a million times, and I still don't get it. The carnal mind can't receive it. We need to wake up to this thing every day because it's so sublime and beyond our carnal ability to grasp and understand the full significance of it. It's so sublime that we can't really understand it. We can't receive it without the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what we need. That's what we need the Spirit for, to quicken our hearts to this truth, to quicken your heart to who you are in Christ because of what he did. Is he worthy of our love? Oh, he's worthy worthy of everything we've got. He's worthy of our lives, and he's worthy of our deaths. He's he's worth dying for. There are no many things in the world worth dying for, but Jesus is worth it. He's worth it all. I, I, I don't know where you are as individuals or a congregation, and I know you're well taught. I do know that because I've known... Brother Benson for long enough, but I want you to, I want to urge you to, 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 to do, I urge you to something better, to chase after something a little higher, and I've, I've been doing this myself in the last couple of years. I really feel that God has called me to, to put more of a focus on simply knowing him. I said something last year at a pastor's conference in Uganda, Africa. I was preaching to a pastor's conference, and 
I said, they, were, they were a strong evangelical denomination, pastors from all over the country. And I said something that shocked them. I preached good the first two days, and they amened everything I said. They loved me. And then I said this. I said, the purpose of the church is not the salvation of sinners. And they started to say amen. I said, well, what did he just say? And I said it again. The purpose of the church, the main purpose of the church is not for the salvation of man. And I saw some people shake their heads, some pastors. Wait a minute. I said, no, no, the main purpose of the church is for the glory of God. But God gets glory in the salvation of men. The two are perfectly compatible. It's not contradictory. It's complementary. But when we make God's glory our main purpose rather than men's salvation, I believe we'll see more salvation. I believe we'll see more healings because God gets glory in healing sick bodies. I believe we'll see more manifestations of his power if we're doing it for the right reasons. Change motives. Let's change our motives. Let our motive be, Lord, I want to know you. I want to be like Augustine. I want you. You are my treasure. You are my eternal bank account. You are my investment for the future. You are what I'm putting my faith in. You are what I want to desire more than I want to desire the things of this world, more than I want to desire a career or money or land or whatever that men love in this world. Him, he is our goal. He is the goal of this life. And he's worth it. He's worth it. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm not going to give an altar call. I'm going to let Brother Benson do that if he wants, but I'm finished up. I really appreciate the opportunity to preach tonight. I just felt like this message is still on my heart. It's still rolling around in my spirit. And I just, I, I feel like it's so important. It's so important that we just refocus. If, if our goal as a church is to put the spotlight on him, yeah. to glorify him, that, that, you know, there used to be a, a preacher in England named Charles Spurgeon. In the, in the 1800s. It's known as the second great evangelical revival. And Spurgeon was a powerful, powerful preacher of the gospel. There was an American man, this was in the days when you couldn't take an airplane, there was no planes, you had to take a ship if you wanted to go to England. And there was an American man from somewhere up in the Northeast, he owned factories. This was in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. And in the Midlands in England, they, were, they, were, they had factories and they had the latest technology. So this guy wanted to go over there and study how they were doing it and bring that technology back into his factories. And his wife said, well, if you get over there, you go and hear Mr. Spurgeon preach. In America, they read Spurgeon's sermons and still do. And the prisons are full of them. They still bless his people. So she said, you make sure you do that. You make sure you go there and you hear Spurgeon preach. He said, yes, ma'am, I'll do that. So he went up there and took care of all of what he had to do. And then he had a few days in London before the ship sailed. So he went to Spurgeon's great metropolitan tabernacle there in London. And they were having a revival that week. Spurgeon would be preaching every night. So he didn't think nothing of it. So he showed up, you know, near time to go to church. And there was a line all the way around out the door. There's no way he's getting in. He had to wait in line. And finally, they, they just didn't have room. So he, okay, I'll get there a little more early next time. So the next day he shows up a little earlier. Again, the same thing happened. The third and final night, he shows up, same thing. No matter how, you know, he just couldn't get in early enough. They were already there. And he turned sadly away, and somebody noticed him. And the guy was an usher in that church. He said, friend, what's wrong? He said, well, I'd hope to hear Spurgeon preach before I sail tomorrow for America. You know, my wife wanted me to hear that, and we read his sermons in America very avidly, and, and he's very popular there. And that guy said, well, is that all? Look, I'm an usher. I've got a seat up front. I'll make a deal with you. You go in and hear my pastor preach, and, and I'll give you that seat for free. All you got to do is come out and give me your honest opinion of Pastor Spurgeon. That's all I want. He said, well, sure, I can do that. So he went in, and Spurgeon preached, and this man was moved. And as he walked out, he just walked out like he was in a daze. He walked right past the usher who was waiting for him. And so the guy said, whoa, whoa, friend, we had a deal. We, we had a deal. I was going to give you my seat, and you were going to give me your opinion of my pastor. Now tell me, what did you think of my pastor? What did you think of Master Spurgeon? And this American said, well, honestly, I didn't see him. He said, what do you mean you didn't see him? Of course you saw him. He was the one preaching. You, you couldn't miss him. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I didn't see him. I only saw Jesus. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. I'm not there. I'm not there. You're probably not either, but that's the kind of goal that we could aspire to. When you love the unlovely, when you bless them that curse you, when, when you quit confessing foolish nonsense trying to get rich off of God and start following him for who he is and what he did at the cross, maybe they'll see Jesus in us just a little bit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Galatians 4.19 up there on the screen. Praise God. You know, did y'all enjoy that? Amen. Amen. Listen, what I heard was not Jimmy. What I heard was a heart. And you know, if somebody's listening to you, are they listening to your head or are they listening to your heart? And Jesus is all about the heart. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth would speak. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you know, I was telling him at Bible school the other night that, that I went into a Best Buy with Lee. Lee and I went into Best Buy and I was looking up some stuff. And the guy at the counter, uh, he might have been gay. I, I don't know. He, he was feminine and he was up there looking through the stuff. And Lee asked him, he said, hey, are you born again? He goes, uh, uh, sorry, sir, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that stuff. And I went, praise God. That's awesome. Paused, you know, and he kind of looked over at me like, that ain't what you usually hear out of preaching. I said, I'm Pastor James Benson. I said, you know, I can honor and respect you as a person who's not moved by what other people say. You know, you got to know who you are before you can be something else. You got to recognize you can't be something else unless you meet someone else. I don't want to know that I know that I know that I know unless I really know that I know that I know. Somebody can challenge you as the best friend you'll ever have. Somebody that will make you say, listen, how many people walk by in that temple ritual and never recognize God? How many? The Gidarian demoniac with a legion in him. Master, have you come apart a time to throw us in the pit? Shut up. I don't talk to demons. Send us into that them, the herd of swine. The people didn't recognize God set that man free. They got ticked off because the pigs died. Everybody in the Bible, biblical stories, the woman with the issue of blood, she said, but if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. She had to break the law to do that. If she'd have been caught in public, they could have stoned her to death. No questions asked. But she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. And she went in there and she touched the hem of his garment. And guess what? Virtue went out of him. She was made whole. She tried to sneak off. And Jesus said, who touched me? His religious fellowship with him said, how in the heck we don't know? I mean, people here, man, they're thronging all over you. He said, where is she? She? She was covered over. You couldn't see what she was. But the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, what are you going to do with your healing? Are you going to just take it off and hide it somewhere? Or are you going to raise up right now and give him glory? And the minute she said, the heck with it. She kicked off that cloak and she said, it's me. And I'm sure Jairus, the high priest, went, what? Is that you? You're the woman with 12. You've been suffering 12 years. and you, well, I know the whole story. My daughter's laying near death. She's dying. But your witness to me right now is getting me up. He says, yeah, it's me. He said, are you healed? He goes, yes, when you t I touched you, boom, everything went out of me. He turned around and he said, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Amen. Thy faith. Listen, somebody broke the law and came to her and witnessed that Jesus was coming through the town. Somebody broke the law. They loved her, and they went to her and told her he was coming. And the minute he crossed over that line, he went out, and he found that she found Jesus, and she touched him, and she got what she confessed. Now, listen, I'm not into, no, I want 20 Cadillacs. I want 14 big houses all over the world. No, I want a sinner. I want someone lost and undone. I want the blind, the naked, the hopeless, the helpless. Give them to me, Lord. Send them my way that I'll be a passage that I'll be a door, that I'll be an utterance for somebody. When you can love a sinner more than you love a saint, you're on the right team. God said, I didn't come to reach those that love me and are reaching out to me. I came for the ones that weren't. So I'm training you to go after the ones who don't. The reason people don't come to Christ is because they judge themselves falsely. Christians are saved, redeemed, blood-bought, God-given to this world, and yet they look at their own sins and go, well, I'm not perfect like Brother Benson. You don't know Brother Benson. That's my wife. She'll tell you, oh, how perfect you think he is. 
We women used to come up at Bud Light and say, hey, uh, you got such an awesome husband. Oh, he's just so awesome. You're so blessed. You want him? You can have him. <laughs> what? Why? Because we all live with each other, and we know none of us have got it all wired. But Jesus didn't come to wire us up. He come to liberate us from ourself. John 15, 16, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Who did he choose? Anybody born again in here? Amen. Then who did he choose? Me. Did he make a mistake? No. Then guess what? He's revealing the hidden man that you don't know yet. Right. We walk in an unfinished product that's being transformed from one glory to another glory to another glory as we are in comp competition with ourself. Right. You have no right to compare yourself to any other believer. You should stand up and say, I'm born again. Everybody say that. I'm a child of the king. I'm an anointed person to set captives free, to heal broken hearts, to open blind eyes. Now listen, that's what Jesus said. He said what he was anointed to do is what we are anointed to do. He said it was the anointing that breaks the yoke. He didn't say you or me that breaks that yoke. He said we take the anointing that's on the anointed one that lives inside us. This little light of mine, i got to let it shine. It's not what I look like or act like. Yeah, I know I'm handsome. I know I'm awesome. But that has nothing to do with it. No, you see, you got to love the person God loved. The person you and I created was of sin. But the person that God created has no sin. Jesus put us in himself when he said, Devil, what do you want for him? I want your blood. I want you dead. Okay. You can kill me. But all the human family is mine. I'm going to get my man back. Look, it ain't the size of a church. It's the size of a believer. My brother, he was out there at the, worked at the harbor master out there, and he led many a man to Jesus out there. He walked in the light that he had. He's a Bible school graduate. And, and look, you don't have to start a church. You are the church. You get up and walk out there and you find someone hurting. Listen, the Holy Spirit, I dare you to pray, Lord, make me a soul winner. Everybody say that. Lord, make me a soul winner. Too late. He heard you. I'm going to tell you something. They will come to you. You'll be in a store and somebody will go, sorry, blankety blank, such and such. I'll tell you, life's just full of blankety blank, blank, blank. And you're going, hee, kee, 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 kee. You're walking over knowing God put that person across your path, not to judge them and condemn them, but to listen to them. You don't know what I've been through, preacher. You don't know what I've gone through in my life. God let me down. I said, he couldn't. He, you weren't holding him up. You can't let God down. You ain't holding him up. That's the lie of the devil. He always comes in and says, you've got to do something to be saved. And the Bible said there's only one thing you need to do. And that's give your life to Jesus. Say, you know, Jesus, I ain't worth nothing. I ain't no good. I don't see no good in me. I know that in my flesh lives no good thing, for the will is present. How to perform that is good, I find not. For the good I would, I do not. But that which I hate, I do. Then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Everybody say sin. sin. Now look. He wasn't talking about all the crubby, dubby, goofy things that we do that are a manifestation called sin. He was talking about a sin nature. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin because all have sinned. See, if you tell me you, that you don't sin, you just call God a liar. He said, if you would confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you say you have no sin, you make God a liar and the truth ain't in you. Listen, a baby is going to poop in its pants. I don't care how much you say, don't, it stinks, it's horrible. You're going to change some diapers. Why? Because it's a process coming from baby to a child. And you've got to take care of it and help it till it gets to the point it can take care of itself. When my son was dying, when he was born, my son was put in the hospital. I just, just got turned on to God. I was a drug addict. I was in prison for driving narcotic dealings. I was all kinds of mess. I was a worthless, worthless, a worthless. But I always helped men. 
I always, there was an anointing inside my life that I had when I was 12 years old because I walked an aisle and gave my heart to Jesus. Let me tell you something. Jesus don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you ever gave your heart to Jesus, he'll never leave you or forsake you. Well, yeah, that ain't what preacher so-and-so said. Well, I don't listen to that preacher. I listen to God. I listen to God. He didn't make this whole mess and let it go on because he hated people. No, he wanted to deliver us. He said it was the devil that snared us. So I went to hell for 18 solid years after I walked that out because I did not know Hosea 4, 6. Motorcycle wreck, in a coma, eight days in a hospital. Didn't know if I was going to make it or not. Wife pregnant with her third child. Out of work, brokered in a skunk. Had to move in with my mother. I said, God, why don't you kill me? He wouldn't answer me. Why? Because that has nothing to do with him. Death is no part of God. Death is a part of the devil. He's the one that created death. You've got to realize that God created life and more abundance of life. That means he wants you to forgive you because he forgives you. Amen. And therefore, he gives you a new nature. And that new nature is what you're to live by. But if you don't study the scriptures, you're not going to know who you are. You're going to visit your old man over and over again. Well, I try to be good. I'm sorry about this. I try to be good and I always fall short. Where in the world can you show me the scripture that God told you to try to be good? How many of y'all try to be saved? How many of y'all try to be married? That's a good one. How many of you try to be parents? God never told us to try anything. If I'd have stood up at that altar with my wife and, and she said, you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife to have a whole love and cherish honor, be faithful to the death, shall divide you, I'll try. She'd go, excuse me, you'll what? What do you mean you'll try? I thought it's I do, I will. Come on, folks. God said, if you'll accept me, I accept you. That was my plan. Now quit condemning yourself, quit judging yourself. Listen. I, I always saw when I heard Hagen preach this one time, I saw, uh, uh, I was driving down the car on the road, and a naked woman, beautiful, ran across the front of the car, stopped right in the middle, and hit my brakes, and then she kept going. The devil said, boy, you sinned big time, man. You looked all over her. What was I supposed to do, shut my eyes and hit her? Listen, you don't sin because a thought comes in your head. No more than you let a bird fly over your head, you don't like it make a nest in your hair. You have to recognize Satan is at busy at trying to take your weaknesses, your infirmities, your shortcomings, and he will know what they are, and he will blast you and tempt you with them. But understand, that has nothing to do with God. That has with you and the devil. And when you say, you know what, Dad? He messed over me again. I fell short. Are you sorry, son? Yes, I am. You're forgiven. Come on, get up. Let's go. God is not the one that's trying to say, well, I'll give you three more tries, and if you don't do it, you're out of here. I'm so sick of preachers that control and manipulate men. Salvation was a free gift. It's given by God to all, to whomsoever will. And when you made that decision, all you need now is to grow up. 1 Peter 2.2 2 said, As a newborn babe... Desire earnestly the sincere milk of the word of God. Wherefore you may grow thereby. If so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Look, grace is something that most people would rather be under law than grace. I can keep the laws. It makes me feel important. But God says, why don't you just accept? Listen, God loves me more than I will ever love him. Don't brag on how much you love the Lord. Usually that's a con. But when you go and say, God, thank you that I'm your special one. I'm so blessed. You love me so much. Oh, Jesus, thank you for loving me. And then all of a sudden you'll fight this other person. You're going, what do you think you're doing? You're getting off behind me. No, listen to me. Either God saved you or he didn't. Salvation was not meritable. It's not earned. It's not deserved. And what religion will do is make you a judge. It'll make you look at the man you're supposed to go out and reach for God and bring him to his kingdom. And you'll look down on him. Oh, save that wretch over there, Lord. He said, I can't. I told you to go over and do it. and You won't do it. Lee had a brother out there at the plant. And he used to work out there. And he was a Croizat Christian. 
And he was backslidden. He was, he'd, he'd like to get with the worldly guys and talk world and get around Lee and talk Jesus. One day he, he walked in on and heard him doing that stuff, and he said, man, look, you need to stop that. What, you're a Christian. You're a believer, and that, that shouldn't come out of you. God said, what fellowship is light with darkness? What fellowship is Christ with the devil? Listen, we've got to understand the responsibility that God gave you and me eternal life. He wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are the children of God. Any person that's prayed and asked, he's in, you're done. It's a done deal. Now you need to ask yourself, where am I at in the Lord? Will you study the Scriptures? And they'll tell you. He said the Spirit will lead you into who you are. And listen, it's a challenge. Everybody knew me as a drug addict. They knew me as all the junk. It was hard for them to see me now as a preacher. They were saying, I, I had to live before people what they couldn't understand. But I had to understand, too. I had to be an obsessed person with the possession that I was. God took me out of darkness. He entered me in the marvelous light. That's what it said in the Scripture. But I had to walk that out till I understood. I'd go to Mardi Gras in New Orleans. I'd go out everywhere I could. We're going to Galveston, the Mardi Gras. We've got our church printed up. We're going to go out there and pass tracks, and we're just going to rejoice and going out there for the opportunity to bring salvation to somebody. I'm not actually quit drinking, smoking, cussing, doing what you're doing. I'm going to introduce you to a piece of information called life. That's all we're to do. We're to give a person the opportunity. You think they might not know it? That guy me and Lee was talking to in that big Best Buy, that guy was sitting there, and man, he, when I told him, I said, man, that's awesome. You're an atheist. Wow. Man, you know what? You're, you've got such a countenance of strength and courage. You stand there and defy everything that's holy and righteous and stand on what you believe. I said, do you think I could change that? But oh, my God can. But it comes by hearing. So, you know what? I'm going to give you that plan of salvation. Now, we're in a busy store. He said, that guy could have dumped me and said, look, I'm busy, sir. I got to go. I ain't got time for this. He didn't. He sent customers over to other people. And he sat there, and he was arrested by my testimony, what I said. I've been to prison. I've been on drugs. I've been all that stuff. And Jesus walked into my life, set me free. He just listened and listened. Then when I went through the plan of salvation, I gave him the Romans road. And when I got through, I said, now, if you could have that assurance in your heart if you died right now, would you go to heaven? Would you want that? He goes, sir, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I, I, I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe that. I said, okay. Well, you know what? Look, brother, I know you're busy. Here's my card. If you ever need someone to talk to, day or night, call me. I have time for you. God bless you, man. See you later. He didn't throw the card away. He stuck it in his pocket. See, we folks are sowing seed. Quit looking at the fruit because you don't see it. You're a product of somebody's prayer from many, many, many years ago. Why won't we be the product of prayer for somebody else? That all of a sudden you'll see them. They what? James Benson? He's preaching the gospel? Come on, man. I used to bow my lids from him, man. We, you know, man, we shot enough speed together. See, all of a sudden, it arrests their thinking. And it challenges them to think, what? He changed? What about you? Because, see, the Holy Spirit will confirm your testimony. When you walk in the light and you stand up and say, I know there's darkness still in me. And, you know, but I'm walking in the light. I'm growing up day by day by day by day. I'm not moved by what I see, taste, touch, smell, and feel. I'm moved by the word of God that is real. When this Bible becomes your best friend, when you love it, when it becomes the best food you can eat, you memorize. I used to take scriptures and write them down at work, and I'd have my, just write them on a page. Every time I'd go back to my office, I was a foreman over cruise, and I'd put down, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'd get it down until I memorized it. As a newborn babe, desire earnestly the sincere milk of the word of God. Wherefore you may grow thereby, if so be that you tasted that the Lord is gracious. First Peter 2, 2. You see, all of a sudden, this is in me. And now wherever you go, you can speak it. You can declare it. You can decree it. You can establish it. And know this. The power of the gospel is the power of God. 
We love the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost is on assignment to take the words out of our mouth that are God's words and give empowerment to them. That word of God is piercing some of your hearts today. And there are many in this room right now, you say, God, make me stronger. You have prayed that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to stand to your feet. If you prayed, God, make me stronger. I want that, God. I want to be that witness. I do not want to pity myself anymore. I want that empowerment. I want that ability to rise up and build your kingdom, God. And Jesus said, I didn't make no mistake when I chose you. I made no apology about dying on the cross for you. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. And therefore, I want you to understand by your voice, when you open your mouth and you say what God said, that makes you godlike. And the more you say it, and the more you say it, and the more you say it, the more you become it. Peter walked in there. He was embarrassed. He was ashamed. He cursed Jesus when he was going up there to die. The cock crowed three times. He had to sit out there for that three days in that wilderness, wailing and crying and throwing dirt in his face. Because I sinned God. I blasphemed you. I'm no good. I'm worthless. But he didn't go hang himself. He prayed and he prayed and he wept and he wept. And then Jesus came back to the dead and said, Go get the disciples and Peter. Don't forget Pete. Because I'm going to make him the head of the church. Losers become the leaders. People tell me they're perfect. I don't mess with them. Give me the ones that get all salty dogs and messed up. I go, Come here, Bubba. You're the ones God loves. You know why? You hate yourself. Most people believe the lie that say, hate yourself, you please God. No, no, no. You die to yourself, and you please God. Amen. Everything the devil says to me, and he told me how ugly and bad and nasty and weird I was and all that stuff, Jesus said, I don't want to hear that come out your mouth anymore. You say what I say. You believe what I say. You do what I say. Jesus gets angry with us when he sees you turning that old unrighteous hooligan that you were around and listening to him instead of going over to the righteous one you are and say, I am the righteousness of God. I'm in Christ Jesus. Everybody say that. I am the righteousness of God. I'm in Christ Jesus. You see, all of a sudden, you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're more than a conqueror through Christ, the anointed one. That strengthens you. Listen, God is not ashamed to call you equal with himself. Jesus said he didn't consider it robbery to call himself equal with the Father. And he said, I want to tell you something. I'm not ashamed for you to see yourself equal with my son. Because you live inside my son. You know, the hardest thing for me to do is an ex-convict, drug addict, dealer, messed up, horrible person. Guess where God sent me when I got out? After that motorcycle wreck. He sent me down to Tech City, a place I got busted, where all my hell went on. God, he said, oh, no, no, no. They know you there. The old you. But now they're going to see the new you. And the guys that busted me, they had seen me carrying a cross down there in Texas City on the, with the kids on Friday and Saturday night. They come and ask me to pray for their children. Amen. The guys that sent me away, they came to my mother, and, and she worked the city and said, your son changed. He really, it worked for him. He really changed. He so, says, no, that didn't change him. Jesus did. See, when you realize God knew you before you ever made a mistake, God said we were predestined before the foundation of the world. We were to be made into his likeness and his image. So don't argue with God. Embrace what God said. You know, God, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but you said I will, so here I go. This brother's been all over the world. I know he's tall enough, his stature's great. He's he got a heart bigger than his body. And I knew that when I first met him. You see, when you love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, when you just want to do his will more than anything else, nothing stops you. We're the light. We're the ones that shine and make the way clear. And a lot of times the enemy is going to show you the old oh, you. And God said, that man don't exist anymore. I crucified him. You were buried in baptism. You've been raised in newness of life. Then by faith, you say what God says about you. So I want you all to pray with me right now and say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come right now. I come to you right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. 
I am your child. Am your Jesus child. is my Lord. Is my I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I build up my holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Not to show off, but to show up. I'm ready to receive. I want from you, Lord. I give myself up tonight. Be my ruler. Be my Lord. Whatever it is you say to me, that's what I will do. I'll no other voice listen to. Because somebody needs me. You got to, I heard a lot of silence when you started saying me. But you got to understand, you are a part of him. He does not separate himself from us. He said we are his workmanship, created in his likeness. Jesus, I want to look more like you. I don't think I got there yet. And you won't until you get to heaven. But when you see him, you're going to be just like him. Isn't it wonderful to know that God looks at you with a smile on his face and says, Woo, look at my children over here. The best kept secret in Lamarck, Texas, right here. And once you break loose out there and you smile on someone and you bring them a big question track and you ask them about their eternity, you don't know what God's doing on the inside. God's already made an appointed time for them to come in. And we get to choose to be a part of it. I want to be a part of somebody's salvation. Heavenly Father, I just come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you right now for the words that are spoken tonight. I thank you, God, for an anointing in this building that is not going to ever leave. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because men and women are coming to full understanding of the law of reciprocity. They are reaping what they are sowing. And God, is they're sowing grace and mercy and favor into their lives, then, Lord, you can use them to go out and bless others. And the kingdom will advance one soul at a time. God, it don't matter how big it is. It matters how true it is. Your word is true. It will not return void. It will prosper and perform until you send it. Now, Father God, I thank you right now for anointing. I thank you. It's anointing that breaks the yoke. And everyone in this room, God, they're sitting under anointing right now. But let them locate the anointing that's in themselves. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. And let us never overshadow that by what someone else thinks. But let us be obedient to say, yes, Lord. You want me to pray for that person at Walmart? I'll pray right now. Yes, Lord. You want me to go to that hospital and pray for that person? I'll do it right now. And I won't be ashamed to say, the Lord sent me over to pray for you. I had a brother call me the other night, crying his eyes out, backslidden, messed up. They told him he might die. He had a heart murmur, had a bunch of stuff going on in him. And I just listened to him belly ache and on the phone. And I said, brother, shut up. That isn't God. You're telling me what the devil's doing. But I want you to tell me what God has already done. Amen. You've been sealed with the full sum. Yeah. And what the devil's doing is condemning you. There's no condemnation that are in Christ. Right. I don't care if you backslide. Whatever you do, you will not. You know that God said he's married to the backslider? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. He's married to the backslider. He ain't looking down on people. He's looking up. Come up. Come to me. Come here. If you've got problems on your walk, get over here. Be honest and true with God, and he will always be honest and true with you. He'll never change his mind about you. So I want us to know in our hearts, we're leaving out here tonight, commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to represent his Father's will in this earth. And that's not condemning, harassing, confusing. It's bringing truth. Simple truth. God loves you. Did y'all receive that tonight? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you so much, God. You love us so much. God, it's so exciting to be a child of the King. It's so exciting to know I can get up in the mirror and look and say, Oh, I love that little guy in that window. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you, God. You don't see him as the world does. You don't see him as the devil does. You see him as your son does. And, Father, we're going to walk out here tonight with our heads held high and say tomorrow's going to be the first day of the rest of my life, and we're going to touch somebody for the kingdom. We love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. praise God. Love someone, you can be dismissed.